this is uh, the second talk of part one of season three in the KO International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. I'm Sung Hun Lee, and this is co-hosted with uh, uh, Shigeto Kawahara from KO University. Uh, the second talk will be by Adam McCollum, and uh, Shigeto will introduce Adam. My, my pleasure. Do you hear me? Um, yes. So Adam got his PhD from the University of California, San Diego in 2019, and he's now an assistant professor at Rutgers University. And as you may know, both of the organizers, me and Sung Hun Lee, have a close affiliation with Rutgers. Um, I used to teach there, Sung Hun got his PhD from there. And um, during this COVID time, I, I, I was reading a lot of stuff and I really liked the paper that Adam recently published in Phonology. It was really a nice combination of computational phonology and real language data. And if you have heard about the sub-regular hypothesis, I found his paper really, really informative. So if you're really curious about that, I suggest that you go read it. And hopefully, I think we're going to hear about it too. So without further ado, Adam, I'll pass your microphone to you. Thank you, Shigeto. Set up here. All right. Uh, so, yeah, thank you again uh, for the intro. Thank you for the invita invitation. It feels uh, it feels like a little bit of cronyism with uh, two Rutgers affiliated people inviting me, but I'll take it. Uh, I, I won't turn it down. Uh, but I, before I get in, I really want to say thank you to the people that I have worked with. Uh, both collaborators and speakers uh, for their time, their patience, um, and their insight. So um, to James Osegbe, Eric Bakovich, and mine, Eric Meinhardt for collaborating, uh, for Judith and John for their time, and for the entire Batrubu uh, community for their willingness to uh, spend their time with outsiders. Uh, so uh, the, today's topic is really about uh, unbounded feature spreading. Uh, unbounded feature spreading is where the some feature, some element of a uh, an element of some, usually a segment in a string, will affect or may affect a potentially unbounded number of segments elsewhere in the string. Canonical examples of this sort of spreading include vowel harmony, nasal harmony, tone spreading, among others. Wilson, 2003 and later in 2006, argues that unbounded feature spreading is myopic. The claim is that for any spreading process, the realization of some symbol and the application of harmony is contingent only on local information. There's no access to and no room for downstream information in the string to affect uh, the application of harmony. So if we schematize this here with these auto-segmental relations, the prediction is that if uh, the feature F is spreading from T to X and to U here, that the features uh, present in Z should have absolutely no effect. So when T spreads to X, the prediction is that U and Z are invisible to the spreading pattern. And when, when T spreads to U, Similarly, uh, every, everything in Z, F, and other features are invisible and irrelevant to the spreading. Now, Wilson's generalization lines up quite nicely with recent work in computational phonology. The claim that phonology is subregular is really, really tied up uh, pretty intimately with the issue of myopia and its relation for unbounded spreading. Um, Myopic spreading patterns fall nicely within a number of subregular classes in the Chomsky hierarchy. Uh, it's just a few categories for us here. Iterative unidirectional spreading is uh, output strictly local. Iterative unidirectional spreading with transparency where some segments are skipped is subsequential. And iterative bidirectional spreading where spreading is going in both directions is weakly deterministic. So let's 
to get ourselves going as our warm up before we get to uh, some of the really interesting stuff in Tujubu, let's see some examples. First, let's uh, consider rounding harmony in Turkish. In Turkish, uh, the round feature of a vowel affects uh, high vowels to its right. So we see dip and use followed by the second singular possessive suffix here, and we see an alternation in rounding. However, non-high vowels don't participate in the pattern. So when we attach the dative suffix to these same roots, there is no alternation because the dative is minus high. It is immune to the effects of rounding. Now, uh, throughout, I'll be uh, putting roots or triggers for uh, patterns in boldface and underlining them. And where there are blocking conditions, they'll be marked with blue. Now, when we put both of these suffixes together, we get a chance to test the uh, test myopia. Uh, and in Turkish, because the uh, second singular possessive occurs closer to the root than the dative suffix, it undergoes rounding because the preceding vowel is round and, um, and harmony is myopic in Turkish. The, the fact that the dative cannot undergo harmony does not affect the application of harmony on the preceding suffix. But problematically, constraint-based theories, particularly agree-based theories of harmony, um, produce some global interactions that are really inconsistent with the type of myopia uh, that we've just seen. If you have an agree-based analysis of this uh, Turk Turkish form here with a highly ranked positional faithfulness constraint protecting roots and a markedness constraint that uh, that bans rounding of non-high suffixes, what you're left with is two constraints uh, to, to winnow down the resulting candidates. And we have agree and ident. And because in both cases, the dative suffix that a vowel cannot undergo harmony, we're guaranteed to have um, an agree violation, passing the adjudication down to ident. And ident prefers the faithful candidate with no spreading over the candidate with partial spreading, which is what speakers actually do. This has been treated as a pathology uh, in the literature called sour grapes, uh, drawn from Aesop's fable. Basically, if spreading can't reach the end of the word, don't spread at all, is the way the pathology uh, goes. And this kind of global interaction seems uh, problematic, uh, seemed to be a problematic prediction of this type of analysis. And in response to this, Wilson and McCarthy developed derivational um, adaptations to classical OT, harmonic serialism, targeted constraints. But as it relates to unbounded spreading, the utility of these is really contingent upon the accuracy and veracity of Wilson's claim that unbounded spreading is always myopic. And that's the focus of today's talk, the status of myopia, looking at data from Tutrubu and its relevance for phonological theory. So again, like Turkish, the vast majority of feature spreading patterns are local, the vast, vast majority. If you run into one on the street, it will most likely be local. So here's an example of a regressive ATR harmony from Assamese. In Assamese, uh, the plus ATR vowel here E, the suffix triggers leftward spreading affecting um, mid vowels in the root. So we see in the first example, um, harmony spreads iteratively to the left, uh, turning both the mid minus ATR vowels to plus ATR. In the second example, we see that the low vowel is unaffected uh, by spreading. The low vowel does not alternate. It has no harmonic counterpart uh, in Assamese, but that does not change the effect of harmony on the following vowel. Harmony targets the open O, mapping it to O, regardless of the fact that there is a downstream blocker. And as another example, we can look at Mande and to see we see rounding and ATR harmony, and they're bidirectional. So this is one of those cool cases where harmony goes in both directions. And here, uh, rounding harmony affects non-high vowels and is blocked by high vowels. ATR harmony affects all vowels. There are no blockers. And so in the first example, harmony uh, spreads the features round and ATR to both edges of the word. In the second example, when we look at leftward spreading into the prefixes, there is a plus high prefix that blocks spreading. 
uh, it prevents that word initial uh, prefix from undergoing rounding. What it does not do though, it, it does not affect the more morphologically interior prefix, ngo. Ngo undergoes rounding harmony, even though there's a blocker later on, this is consistent with myopia. And so the, the cases that we've looked at thus far, Turkish, Assamese, Mande, they all are fairly local, but some other harmony patterns allow skipping, where some segments, particularly some vowels, um, don't undergo uh, the pattern and that they do not affect or do not arrest the, uh, the correlation of the feature. So Wolof is an example of these. Wolof uh, spreads uh, uh, features for ATR, uh, right word in the word, but high vowels are immune to harmony and they are transparent to it. High vowels do not undergo uh, harmony and they do not affect it. So the imperatival suffix to the right of the suffix E alternate based on the ATR values of the root and ignore the ATR value of the intervening suffix. But crucially, even in these cases where they're skipping and there seem to be non-local dependencies, downstream information does not affect spreading. So in the bottom examples here, we have the agentive suffix cot. Cot never alternates for harmony. It, it is lexically specified. It is an exceptional morpheme but its presence or absence does not affect the application of harmony for any elements to its left in the word. Again, harmony is myopic, downstream information does not affect uh, the application of the feature spreading pattern. And then we go to tone. And tone just, just messes everything up for us. Uh, what was once beautiful and clean becomes messy and actually far more interesting. And so, in, um, in Luganda, for example, there's a pattern that's been called unbounded tonal plateauing. Uh, if we look here first at two examples where no tonal spreading occurs, we can see a couple key things. In the words for chopper and log, we see that the presence of a high tone does not initiate spreading on its own. So the fact that chopper and log each have a high tone that in and of itself does not result in any spreading of that high tone. But when we put these two words together in a compound, uh, the compound has two high tones. And in cases in Luganda where a word or compound or a phrase has two high tones, any intervening low tones or alter, uh, alternatively toneless syllables undergo uh, plateauing. They are raised to high tone. And this process occurs over incredibly long distances. And so the realization of some tone bearing unit in Luganda depends on information that might be an unbounded distance in both directions. And that's really, really important. In the harmony cases that we've looked at thus far, the dependency was only in one direction. But in the Luganda case, it is, it's a bi-directional dependency and there is no obvious uh, constraint on the distance of that dependency. It seems like it can go over lots and lots of tone bearing units. And so Jardin 2016 discussing these patterns coins the term unbounded circumambient. An unbounded circumambient process is one whose application is dependent on information on both sides of the target. And it's unbounded circumambient processes are ones in which on both sides, there's no bound on how far the information may be from the target. And crucially for the subregular program, unbounded circumambient processes are not subregular because the realization of some element requires access to information of potentially unbounded distance in both directions. This requires a, a non-deterministic regular function, something that is fully regular in terms of ex expressivity. So thinking about this, Jardine's proposal actually subsumes a lot of what Wilson was talking about. Wilson's claim was really centered around blocking effects, where some blocker downstream doesn't affect preceding or potentially following um, targets for harmony. But Jardine subsumes blocking, triggering, and all other effects by this, uh, by unbounded circumambience, suggesting that no 
non-local dependencies, no bi-directional non-local dependencies uh, should exist in a myopic uh, or in a, um, a simpler, computationally simpler type of pattern. So we have a blocking situation here where the presence of minus F on Z, if it were to affect the spreading from F to X and U, this would be a unbounded circumambient blocking. But we have the Luganda type case too, where the presence of multiple triggers uh, could, could affect the realization of some symbol. And this is equally expressive here. And then we have a third case that uh, that's also subsumed under Jardine's distinction. And it's an interaction between different features. This isn't blocking by F, by a minus F feature or triggering by a second plus F. This is just a seemingly um, unnatural uh, dependency between F and G here. The presence of G, if it affects the realization of F on X and U, in this case, this would also be a fully regular unbounded circumambient dependency. And so as we think about Wilson's original claim about feature spreading, maybe we, maybe we should follow Hyman and say tone is different. Tone, there's just something special about tone. It is unique the way it interacts with prosody and syntax. And maybe we can make the, uh, the restricted claim that unbounded spreading in segmental phonology is myopic. And as a consequence, only segmental phonology is subregular. That's one possible claim to make um, based on Jardine's data uh, and its counterexample to the subregular hypothesis and Wilson's claim. So that's where Tutrugbu comes in for us. Uh, Tutrugbu is a Ghana Togo mountain language spoken by around 5,000 uh, in southeastern Ghana. The vast, vast majority of the work describing the language has been done by my collaborator, James Asegbe. Uh, I came in on this project when I was working on my master's. Uh, a number of years ago, and James has done the lion's share of the work. Uh, he deserves the credit for, um, for finding and, um, yeah, and describing some of the wonderful things going on here. So to Trugbu, as we start thinking about its phonology, it's important for us to know, um, because we'll be talking about vowel harmony, how, how many contrasts there are, and what are the nature of those vowel contrasts. There are nine vowel contrasts in the language we see um, in the top four rows here, we see four alternating pairs. Uh, we see ATR um, on the right and minus ATR on the left. Uh, we, there's an alternation between A ah and A. In the first row, in the second row, there's an alternation between A ah and O. In the third, there's an alternation between A e and E. And in the fourth row, there's an alternation between A ah and O. Uh, and in the, uh, in the fifth row down here at the bottom, we have uh, the root internal vowel, eh, it does not occur in affixes. It occurs root internally only and exhibits no alternations. So this leaves us with a, uh, with a nine vowel inventory with four ATR contrast. Uh, again, the uh, front mid minus ATR vowel, eh, is unpaired and only occurs within roots. One thing that's important to know here is that the plus high minus ATR vowels transcribed as I and U are actually phonetically identical to E and A. So if you were wondering about my pronunciation of them uh, on the previous slide, it's because uh, they are actually phonetically mid vowels. Um, the, the only way to really distinguish the two in the language is their phonological patterning. Uh, and there are key differences that affect rounding harmony uh, as well as ATR harmony. And if, if you have questions about those, we can definitely discuss that during the Q&A. So for the ATR harmony, um, the ATR value of the root, uh, which is typically the rightmost morpheme in a word, determines the ATR value of prefixes. So spreading initiates from the right and goes leftward. Uh, height is really important. Uh, to delimit the application of harmony in the language. And so uh, as we discuss these, we'll be looking at these through um, based on prefix vowel height. In the first case, if all prefixes are minus high, spreading obtains uh, all the way to the left edge of the word. Uh, we see that here with the third singular and future prefixes. Uh, we see another set of examples here, a slightly longer word. We also, in this 
um, bottom most example here, we see the application of rounding harmony. Rounding harmony isn't our focus, but rounding harmony is triggered by non-high vowels on the left edge of the word and spreads rightward to non-high prefixes. So both rounding harmony and ATR harmony apply in the bottom most example. But now we've seen that harmon ATR harmony obtains if all prefixes are minus high. If all prefixes are plus high, harmony similarly obtains. So in the first singular and in the negation prefixes here, we see regular alternations based on the ATR value of the root. We see this uh, for the first person plural as well. And we see a slightly longer example here uh, where we have the class five marker uh, that's uh, co-indexing uh, the subject of the sentence, the, a lizard. Uh, and so we see first person singular, first person plural. We see the class five marker. We have a feature-based generalization here um, that all plus high things, if a word is composed of some root plus all plus high prefixes, those prefixes will undergo harmony. So thus far, we've seen plus high prefixes and minus high prefixes. They all undergo harmony. Now, if the initial syllable prefix is minus high, harmony also obtains. It iteratively spreads leftward, um, affecting everything within the word. In the second example, we see a little bit more rounding harmony. Another th one thing to note about rounding harmony is rounding harmony skips high vowels. So we do see uh, skipping of the negation prefix here. But in both cases, ATR harmony is our focus, and ATR harmony spreads all the way to the left edge of the word if the initial syllable prefix is high. Now, this is where it's really interesting, and this is, this is the crux of it. This is uh, the data that's most uh, important for all of us here. When the initial syllable prefix is plus high and is followed at any distance by a minus high prefix, that, that minus high prefix blocks the spread of harmony. So in the topmost example, we have a minus ATR root. So we see the prefixes surfacing according to their underlying specifications. In the second example, we see we have a plus ATR root and we expect spreading to obtain here, but it doesn't. And that's surprising. This is the first example we've seen of spreading not um, reaching the left edge of the word. And in this case, it's blocked by by this future prefix, we've already seen that the future prefix alternates for harmony elsewhere in the language. The, the future prefix and other non-high prefixes fail to alternate only when the initial syllable vowel is plus high. Uh, we, we see this here with the negation prefix in between the two, uh, even when the initial syllable vowel and that blocking uh, non-high vowel are not syllable adjacent the same um, blocking of harmony uh, occurs. And one more example, uh, just, to, uh, just to fill this out for us a little bit. Now, uh, let's uh, go from smaller to larger words to see how long these dependencies can be. Because the, the issue is here, uh, the the two conditions on blocking, a medial non-high prefix and a word initial high vowel, they're syllable adjacent. So the two conditions that need to be met for blocking are beside each other. But here in the second word, they're separated by a syllable. So that ka prefix, the perfective, and the first singular prefix are no longer syllable adjacent and blocking still obtains. Blocking obtains here with the rightmost um, prefix is the progressive, it is two syllables away from that word initial prefix, blocking obtains. There's blocking in this form as well, despite the fact that there are three syllables inter intervening between the ventive suffix and the first singular pronominal prefix. And here we see uh, you can actually stack two ventive prefixes on a word to make something really emphatic. And this rightmost ventive prefix blocks harmony, even though the left edge of the word is one, two, three, four, um, four syllables away. That word initial prefix is four syllables 
uh, away from that rightmost prefix and harmony is still blocked. And just as a point of comparison, we get to see what happens when we change the word initial prefix. When the word initial prefix is minus high, harmony obtains, everything's good, uh, everyone's happy, it looks simple, it's, it's nice looking, but when you have um, a plus high word initial prefix and a following minus high uh, medial prefix, uh, everything goes crazy. Uh, so one, one more thing to say here, it's not the case that spreading just fails totally in these cases. It's that spreading is specifically blocked by the minus high prefix. And we see this by sandwiching a plus high prefix in between the blocking context and the root. The it of prefix is high and it um, occurs more for tactically between the root and any minus high prefixes. And when it is attached to a plus ATR root, it always undergoes harmony, regardless of the blocking that may come downstream. So there is, in this, in this little corner, uh, there is some uh, myopia. But as soon as you encounter a non-high prefix, uh, it becomes necessary to know the entire string to know if harmony will obtain. Here's another example again with lizard. Uh, I just like lizards, uh, I guess. So you get lots of examples with lizard. So again, to, to summarize for us, regressive spreading uh, in the language is non-myopic. It's non-myopic because the realization of harmony on a prefix like ba here is not dependent on the information in ba and the information in wu alone. If, if that information were sufficient to determine the realization of Ba, this would be myopic, but uh, we need to know more information. You need to know what precedes Ba, and that can be one syllable, two syllables, three syllables, four syllables away. And moreover, you don't need to just know that this I is here. You need to know that it's at the left edge of the word. And so this is an incredibly non-local dependency Again, we have our, um, our little minimal pair here where their third singular and first singular pronominal prefixes are toggled. When the third singular prefix is present, harmony um, obtains throughout the word. When the first singular, first plural, class five, or any plus high prefix is there, harmony is blocked by the low vowel. So um, our, our summary here, ATR harmony is regressive and it depends on vowel height. Harmony obtains if all prefixes are minus high. Uh, if all prefixes are plus high, my data points are switched here. And uh, if the initial syllable vowel is minus high. Harmony, however, is blocked by a minus high vowel if and only if the initial syllable vowel is plus high. Uh, one thing to note here, Yonga talked about variation some. There is variation uh, in the language, uh, specifically with how speakers treat uh, these medial uh, low vowel prefixes. Uh, for some speakers, um, in this case, harmony is blocked. Whereas for other speakers, the medial ah is transparent. But only in this case, remember elsewhere in the language, harmony affects everything. It affects non-high and high vowels equally, except in this particular blocking context. For many speakers, harmony is blocked, but for some speakers, the neutral vowel is transparent and ATR skips uh, the low vowel and affects uh, high vowels to its left. So one thing to know about the variation, and the variation actually isn't significant as we think about myopia though. For all speakers, the behavior of these prefixal ah vowels depends on the height of the initial syllable vowel. For some speakers, this odd blocks harmony for others, the odd is transparent. But in both cases, for those with transparent awe and those with blocking awe, the application of harmony depends on information, a potentially unbounded distance in both directions. An awe may be unboundedly far from the initial syllable. We've seen examples with that, but awe may be unboundedly far from the root. Uh, if we look at the perfective suffix here, it's one, two, three syllables from the root. Uh, it's two syllables from the edge of the word. Uh, these 
uh, these interactions are, uh, according to Jardine's terminology, unbounded circumambient. And just like tonal plateauing in Luganda, ATR harmony in Tutrugu is unbounded circumambient. As a, as a result of this, we can say with certainty that unbounded spreading in segmental phonology is not always myopic. It might be most of the time, but it's not always so. And in fact, uh, recent work has discovered that there are a number of other languages that exhibit very similar patterns. The neighboring um, mutually intelligible language Tafi has an ATR harmony that's identical to two true moves. Uh, Nico and Yaka uh, are Bantu languages spoken elsewhere in Africa, and ATR harmony uh, in Nico uh, is going the opposite direction, affecting suffixes, but exhibits the same kind of dependency and high harmony in Yaka. Um, is, is very similar. And so you might think, well, maybe unbounded circumambience and maybe this kind of really complex, unnatural uh, kind of phonological pattern, maybe it's just restricted to tone, or maybe it's just restricted to vowels and vowel harmony. Maybe there's something weird about tone and vowel harmony. Well, actually, uh, research with a student of mine, Tatavik Yoyan, and I, we've been looking at liquid dissimilation in Yidin. And in Yidin, you see the same pattern, uh, the same type of non-local dependency uh, for a consonantal pattern, not just for an assimilation pattern, but for dissimilation, suggesting that this is not something for assimilatory patterns or vowels or tone bearing units, but this these type of things can occur for all types of segmental phonology as well as tonal phonology. And so thinking back to the original problem with the agree-based analysis in OT, if these kinds of non-local global interactions are present, it suggests that maybe the predictions aren't quite as bad. I'm not saying the predictions are great, but they're not quite as bad as what we thought because non-myopia does exist in harmony. We found it. Nothing that looks exactly like the sour grapes prediction, but things that are closer to it than what we thought 20 years ago. And as a consequence, any sufficiently expressive theory of feature spreading must allow for potential look ahead. If we want to generate attested languages, there have to be mechanisms in our formal theory that can do this. And as, and as it relates to the subregular program, any sufficiently expressive theory of phonology cannot be categorically subregular, at least over string-based representations, that there must be room for fully regular interactions like we find in Tutrubu. So a question that yong was asking uh, is about biases. And uh, it's a question that I'm concerned about and I'm interested in too. Like what are the nature of biases? Um, previous work proposed a hard bias, a categorical constraint saying harmony and feature spreading in general can't be non-myopic. We see that this isn't the case. Um, but if we say that you know, there, there is no constraint any longer. We miss the fact that the vast, vast majority of attested patterns really are quite computationally simple. They don't exhibit look ahead, they are very local. And so if we wanna account for these distributional differences across the languages of the world, it seems like uh, soft biases give us uh, a much better fit uh, to the data. But as we think about biases, the question arises, how do we make typological generalizations? A real challenge is the fact that we don't have much access to the languages of the past, of the tens of thousands of languages that have been spoken and are no longer spoken by humans, we, we know very little about them. And in fact, languages that are presently spoken, the 7,000 or so, we, we know very little about those too. We, you know, maybe there are a few hundred that we have a reasonable understanding of, uh, but for so many of them, we don't know. It makes it very difficult to generalize from, a, from an incredibly small and non-representative sample of, of what's possible in human language. It makes it really possible to extrapolate from that and say, phonology is this, or phonology is that. It's a real challenge. I'm not saying it's typological, typological generalizations are something we shouldn't do because these, these generalizations, they drive research. Wilson's claims have driven subsequent work by Jardine, myself and others, and that's great. Uh, but it, 
it becomes challenging as we make these generalizations, how do we do it? And then how do we evaluate them? And one thing that I think computational approaches to phonology really offers here is a way to evaluate generalizations and claims. Uh, computational approaches like formal language theory, the, the work that's associated with the subregular program provides a theory independent way uh, to, to talk about the expressivity of a pattern. Uh, and it provides a way to test uh, and, and evaluate the predictions of theory as well as thinking about what is attested in human language. So thank you to you all or in Tutrubu Wana BTBO, which also has some ATR harmony. Um, and you know, I just thought I had to share it with you guys. But again, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm here uh, too. Uh, if you uh, have, uh, okay, let's uh, applause first. Uh, please send me your name and a uh, question if you have. Um, I'm sending you a message, so I'll just uh, respond to them. So, Adam, this is just a clarification question, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I know many, I think most of the uh, things, even though they look like uh, uh, small, small morphemes, uh, they are actually sentences, right? Uh, this, uh, does yeah. this pattern uh, uh, can uh, happen also in biclausal structure or is it uh, limited to the clause? Or do you have, do you, do you happen to know the, what the data shows? No, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, the, the work, most of the work we've done has been within the verb phrase, uh, looking at verbal morphology specifically. There are some examples that we've stumbled across, just like saying thank you here, where we see, uh, where we see spreading across word boundaries. But in terms of um, the domain of spreading within the large, larger syntactic phrases, we're, we're not sure right now. And so, uh, you know, part of continued field work is figuring out in these phrasal contexts, uh, what are the what are the conditions on spreading? Uh, how far does it you know how far does it extend? Right. The reason why I asked was because in uh, some of the Bantu languages you see high tone spreading that are characterized as unbounded spreading. Of course, there is some like non finality issue, and it seems like uh, some of them are sensitive to whether the uh, object noun phrase is. Uh, unary or binary. Uh, so you would see some kind of spreading into the noun if it's unary, but uh, the spreading from left to right will not necessarily happen if it's a binary noun phrase. And uh, if you see that kind of uh, sensitivity in ATL vowel harmony, that would be cool in the future. Yeah. Well, there, there actually, there's some work uh, on a, uh, a language from Ghana, Kwa language, Kwa, uh, by mm -hmm. Michael Abiri Yavwa, that has been showing uh, crossword uh, spreading that is sensitive to uh, the size of the uh, of the prosodic constituents and the, the size of the of uh, the resulting phrase. And so there's uh, been some work, I believe, looking with match theory uh, on matching these harmony domains with uh, prosodic domains in Gua. So th there is some out there, and, and I'm curious to see what we find in Tuchupu. Right. I will ask uh, uh, the reference for that later. Yeah, sure. thank you for letting me know. Uh, next question comes from uh, Andrew Lehman from UMass Amherst. Andrew, go ahead. Hey, Adam. Uh, hey, good to see you. Yeah, you too, man. Uh, this is always just like the best data set. Um, I, I'm curious about the Yudin kit, and I, I see you have 30 extra slides, so I'm hoping that you can you have stuff on Yudin, because my, my I, memory I, was that at least the the interacting laterals were at least like morphotactically local, but I can you like comment on that? Yeah, so I, I don't have it in in the extra slides in the deck, but it's it's fresh enough where I can I can at least talk meaningfully about it. Uh, so for for everyone in the Yidin case, uh, you have a if a a lateral is followed by another lateral, it dissimilates to the rhotic. Um, so this, it, there are actually a number of interesting things. It's actually lexically restricted where there's only a certain 
Um, it only seems like, I believe it's the going aspect suffix uh, that undergoes this. So it seems like there's an exceptional undergoing aspect of this when it's followed by the commentative suffix, it, um, it changes. But uh, the, then you have this, uh, what has been called peripheral blocking in the, uh, in the literature on it, where if there's a preceding rhotic, the preceding rhotic prevents the, the lateral from undergoing dissimilation. And what Dixon in his grammar describes, he, he talks about one possible way to do this as a, a double dissimilation. Basically, you have two patterns. One is lateral dissimilation and one is rhotic dissimilation. Lateral dissimilation precedes the rhotic one and you get a Duke of York derivation. Um, and in Amanda Payne's 2017 paper, on the uh, subsequentiality of dissimilation. She talks about the fact that if you do this with two subsequential functions, you can, uh, you can get this to work. But the, the issue uh, here is that you end up with interacting subsequential functions where the order of the function really matters. Uh, and as co-authors of mine and I have argued, as you know, Andrew, that yeah. uh, in these cases, if you have interactions there, uh, that this is no longer a weakly deterministic or subsequential mapping, but it's fully regular. Yeah, I guess my question was more like if you read from the left uh, and you see a rhotic and a lateral, my, I mean, my memory at least is that you only have to then go like four more segments to ever find the next liquid. And I, 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 I guess I was curious if there are if there are cases where you actually you get that bound or uh, where you right you break that bound on the on the lateral distance. Yeah, I, I I don't know of any. I mean the you know the data set is that is quite small. Yeah. Uh, that you know that Dixon draws on there. And you know, I, I guess I'm always suspicious about like, you know, when we sort of bring a potential like ISL, like can we wait how long? What kind of K do we need to get this to yeah. work? Because it, it always feels like maybe I'm hacking the system a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Um, but you know I mean that's it's at least a possibility. Uh, and, yeah. you know, maybe speakers do entertain something like that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Uh, Shigeto, if you have a uh, question. Yeah, thanks. So um, I think you mentioned you already answered some of my questions toward the end. But, you know, during my graduate training at UMass, McCarthy always told me that the strength of OT is that it makes typological predictions. And you seem to be implying that you can't really use typological generalizations for, no, for phonological argumentation, or am I going too far? What, what's your thoughts on, like, you know, what kind of typological generalization are we allowed to make based on the limitations that you have mentioned. Sure, no, I, I, I completely agree that one of the real strengths of OT is that it makes concrete testable predictions. I think, I think OT and computational approaches are really complementary here because one of the challenges with OT is assessing, you know, how, how complex something is. You know, there've been a lot of things demonstrating that once global optimization is operating, that things can get kind of unwieldy from a computational point of view. But at the same time, computational work, if completely divorced from substance, there are lots of things that are computationally simple that we just don't find a whole lot of uh, in the world's languages, presumably because they have no interaction with the kinds of things that language learners seem to be paying attention to. Uh, and so, you know, the issue comes with Tutrubu, for instance, it seems like the interaction here is really unnatural. Why in the world does the height of a medial prefix <clears throat> and the height of a word initial prefix, why do they interact in the way they do to allow or block harmony? There's no obvious, <clears throat> there's no, you know, immediately obvious appeal to psycholinguistic um, you know, ease of processing or, you know, any sort of phonetically grounded attempt that, you know, has motivated a lot of work in OT. And I think rightfully motivating a lot of work in OT and constraint-based theories. But once you introduce this sort of unnatural things, you know, it, it, yeah, constraining the naturalness of a phonological theory, trying to fit the data and computational expressivity, it's a challenge. And I think a lot of these things are complementary. Great, thanks.
Thank you. I think uh, that's the time uh, we have for the main session. Uh, let's thank uh, Adam one more time. Thank you very much. Uh, before uh, we will continue our discussion after wrapping up the event uh, first. Uh, so I would like to thank the assistants, uh, Yuki and Migiwa, uh, and uh, also, of course, the co-host Sigeto Kawahara. This event was supported by the Institute of Cultural and Linguistic Studies at KU University and the Linguistic Lab at International Christian University. The next part, and uh, season three has only uh, two parts of this these talks, um, will be held two weeks from now on February 11th. Uh, Juliet Stanton from New York University and Amanda Riesling from University of California Santa Cruz will share their work. Uh, thank you all who participated in today's colloquium and we hope to see you in our next talks. Uh, the recording will now be stopped.